You remember the one about the boy who cried wolf, don't you? Maybe the details are a little bit fuzzy, so let me remind you how it goes. It's a great story. There's a village, right, and it's up in the mountains, and they pick one boy from among all the boys in the village to go out into the mountains and watch the sheep. He's going to be the shepherd of all the sheep. And he's told, the boy is told, that the job requires not much but a keen eye and careful attention because out there in the woods, out there in the mountains and the hills, there are wolves, and the wolves like tasty sheep. Now it's the job of that boy to keep his eyes open, and if he sees any of those deadly beasts, he is to let loose a great cry, wolf, at which the villagers promise that they will come running. Right? They're down in their workshops, but his father and his uncles and the other men of the village say, as soon as you say wolf, boy, we will be there in a minute. All you have to do is say the word. Well, you know how little boys are, and you remember what the sto- how the story goes. You know that the job was easy enough, that the scenery was pleasant enough, that the sheep were sheepy enough. All of which is to say, the boy got bored. After all, watching sheep isn't exactly thrilling for grown men, let alone for little boys who like to do all kinds of things. And so the boy gets an idea, right? What fun, he thinks. What fun it would be to see my dad and my uncles, to see the other men of the village come racing and panting up the hill. And so he shouts out, Wolf! And the men of the village, just like they promised, come huffing and puffing up the hills. And the boy laughs, and the men yell, don't do that again, it's not funny. And the boy says, oh, I'm so, so sorry, but it was a lot of fun. And if something's fun once, well, surely it's fun a second time. And so some time goes by, and watching those sheep proves to be just as unfun the second time as it was the first time. And so the boy says again, wolf, and the men come running. Sorry, says the boy. Don't do that again, says the men. And so he settles back in. But the third time, you know that there's a change in the story. You know that finally the boy sees not just white sheep on the green pastures, but he sees a great gray wolf bounding out of the forest. Bah, say the sheep. And the boy cries out, wolf, wolf, wolf. But down in the village, they've learned their lesson. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, but you're not going to fool me three times. And so they stay, his father and his uncles and the other men of the village, they stay down in the village. And up in the hills, the wolf has a feast, mutton and little boy. It's a story about warnings, isn't it? A warning about warnings. Wolves and the danger that they represent are to be respected, not treated as some kind of a game. Warnings are too important to be joked about. So you don't yell fire in a public place, and you don't shout about wolves if there aren't, in fact, wolves. Now, you heard a warning from Jesus this morning, didn't you? Beware, he says. Be warned. Be advised. Keep yourselves, Jesus says, from false teachers. Outwardly, they are dressed up as sheep, but inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. Our Lord sounds the cry today, or he at least tells us what to expect. But it's a little bit harder, isn't it, than seeing a a wolf among the sheep. Turns out that us villagers need to be perceptive and not lazy. Let me try to put it into terms of the boy and the wolf again, because I like that story. So imagine, right, imagine that the boy sees the wolf dressing itself up in the sheepskin disguise. If he cries out, wolf, and the men come running, and the boy says, that one right there is a wolf. <laughs> I'm not pointing at you for any particular reason. If he says, that one's a wolf, and the other men say, well, it doesn't look like a wolf. It looks just like sheep. But if the boy insists, no, I really mean it, that one is a wolf. And if the men of the village say, well, let's go ask him. Let's go ask the the sheep. Are you actually a wolf? Sure enough, that sheep, that wolf dressed up as a sheep, is not going to say, you got me. I'm a wolf because the wolf is hungry. And so he'll lie and he'll lie and he'll lie. And if the men try to say, well, look, we asked. And he said that he's actually a sheep. And they go back down to the village. Well, the wolf is going to have a snack, young child and mutton. 
Do you see the point? Maybe I shouldn't put it in parabolic terms, and I probably shouldn't point at, at June. That's not nice of me. Wolves among sheep are a problem, to be sure. Wolves clothed in sheep's clothing, though, are a much worse problem. Warnings shouldn't be tossed around lightly. That's true enough. But we shouldn't get it into our minds that there is no danger, that all warnings are pointless. We must be on our guard for the things that Jesus says to be aware of. For Jesus and his apostles are not little boys crying wolf just to make you agitated, just to make you squirm. We don't read these readings because we want you to say, oh boy, I'm a little nervous about false teachers. No, these things are spoken to you so that you would not be eaten up by wolves. For false teachers, clothed as sheep, have plagued the church and continue to throughout the church's history. They come dividing and devouring and polluting and leading off souls, not to some other pleasant green pasture that's just as good over there. No, they lead souls into perdition. And all the while, all the while, the false teacher claims to be true. They always claim to be on your side, to be saying these things for your good. Imagine those false prophets that Jeremiah spoke about. If you had gone up to one of those false prophets and said, you know, you really, are you actually a true prophet or a false one? I'm sure they would all say, no, we're, we're true. We're honest. We're good. It will be well with you. Jesus warns us to be on our guard, to not simply accept everything just because it has the veneer of Christianity. Not all who say, Lord, Lord, are among the true teachers of the church. But we should be clear that that's actually a problem. I'm not so sure in our day and age that we share the same assumption as Jesus. You know what happens when you assume things, right? So we should be sure that we actually are on the same page as Jesus. Jesus and St. Paul, who warned the elders in Ephesus, assume something, don't they? They assume that false teaching is actually destructive. And they assume that their hearers will simply be on board with that. But in our day and age, do people really believe that? That doctrine matters? That teaching, doctrine, should be pure? That it should be true? Churches invest a lot of time and energy into all kinds of other things, right? Churches invest much in advertising and optics and the multiplication of programs for everybody possible. A great deal of time and energy is put into planning how to produce a certain Sunday experience. A happy one, right? We want everyone to be happy. But where does teaching come in? Where does doctrine come into that conversation? It's pretty low on the list. After all, doctrine might divide people, right? Doctrine might challenge what you assume. Doctrine, teaching, might lead to correction. And my goodness, nobody likes to be corrected. With that mindset, a warning about false teaching might seem rather old-fashioned, out of style. Maybe that was something that used to matter, Jesus and St. Paul, but it's not that critical anymore, is it? You know, of course, where we stand on that position, but I want to remind you this morning, I want to caution you against this idea that doctrine and teaching is somehow either just for the preacher or is somehow beneath us as Christians. Doctrine matters. Do you know why? Doctrine matters because it is the teaching. It is the teaching of the church that actually delivers Christ to you. It is through teaching. It is through the doctrine of the church that Christ and all of his glory, Christ and all of his work, the forgiveness of your sins is made known to you. Just imagine, right? Just imagine going home this afternoon and thinking, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to talk to my mom or my sister or my brother or my neighbor. I'm going to tell them about Jesus, And so you go over to your neighbor or whoever this other person might be and you try to have a conversation about Jesus without any of that doctrine getting in the way. Jesus loves you, you say. To which the person responds, well, why wouldn't he? (laughs) What difference does it make if Jesus loves me? Why is that good news? Why shouldn't he love me? What good is his love? How do I know that he loves me? These are the questions that come up. And as soon as you begin to answer those questions, what will you be doing? You will be teaching. 
You will be sharing the teaching of who Christ is. You will be saying something about God and about the Trinity, something about Christ becoming man for our sake, something about his death on the cross in your place, something about his resurrection and the sending of his spirit, something about the resurrection of all people and the life of the world to come. And if you don't know any doctrine, well, you're going to be left stuttering and saying, well, he loves you. Doesn't that make you feel good? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but without the teaching, without the doctrine, it doesn't stick with a person. Nothing is delivered. Doctrine matters because it delivers, and without doctrine, there is no delivery. Without teaching, there is no delivery. With false teaching, there is false delivery, empty hopes, empty dreams. I could give you many analogies for what doctrine is like, but let's stick with Jesus. What does he say? He compares teachers to trees, and that means that their teaching is like fruit. So think of it this way. The teaching of God's word that the Bible is so full of, the Bible is chock full of teaching. The teaching of God's word, his law and his commandments, his gospel and his promises is fruit for your soul. Think of that this morning, the Bible as a tree, this pulpit as a tree, the church as a tree from which you are given to eat up the fruit of God's word. It's peach season. I don't know if you go down to the farmer's market, but it's peach season. So think of it that way. God's word is a book full of peaches, full of fruit for you to take and pluck and to eat. And it is the job of the preacher, it is the job of the teacher to make that fruit known to you so that you can eat it, so that your soul can live on God's law, so that you can eat up his commandments, his law as healthy and good food for your soul to guide you in what you should do, so that you can digest his holy law and let it correct you when you err, so that you can eat up that fruit of God's word and be guided for all of life. But not only does God have his law like fruit in scripture, he also has the good news. He also has the gospel of his promises there laid out for you that you might savor and treasure it, that you might eat and live, that you might take and eat of the fruit of Christ, that you may know his forgiving promises to wash you in the waters of holy baptism, that you may know and eat his instituted meal of bread and wine that he promises is not just bread and wine, but is his own body and blood. Here is the fruit of teaching that delivers to you what Christ promises. The world is full of teaching, but it's not all the same. Just like not all fruit is the same. If you go down to the farmer's market, I said this in early service, and some of the farmers there um, in early service kind of gave me a, a bad look. But you know how farmers are, don't you? They put the good fruit on top, and underneath, what do they put? They put the moldy stuff. So when you get home and you take the peaches out of the top layer of your bushel there, you find not just peach fuzz, but green fuzz. Not all teaching is good, healthy teaching. Some of it is moldy. Some of it is rotten. Some of it is bad for you and will actually make your stomach and your soul ache. Beware then what you're eating. Be careful what fruit you take from the trees. Be careful which trees you are around. But how do you recognize them? Because it's easy enough, right, to recognize a good peach from a bad peach. But how do you recognize good teachers from false ones, especially when they all claim to be telling the truth? It's critical to know so that you don't suppose, like the imaginary townsfolk, that a simple question is all that's needed. After all, if you ask the wolf in sheep's clothing, what's she going to say? I really am a sheep. How can you know? By their fruits you shall know them, Jesus says. It's true that if you ask that wolf dressed up as a sheep, he will claim that he's no wolf. But if you watch him, If you see how the wolf in sheep's clothing moves, pretty soon it's obvious that ain't no sheep. And so Jesus tells us to watch the fruit of our teachers. Pay attention to what they say and compare it to what God's word says. Pay attention not just to what they say, but watch also what they do. How did Jesus put it? There are those who do the will of my heavenly father, and then there are those who are workers of lawlessness. 
This is how you see through the sheep's clothing. Here is how you test the fruit of the trees. Is the teacher doing the will of the heavenly father or is he promoting lawlessness? Do the words from the pulpit speak clearly of God's holy and righteous law, a law that is so often ridiculed and made light of in our day and age? Does the pastor proclaim the saving will of the Father who sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save it by his blood? Does he preach a hot law and a hot gospel, a gospel that saves from hell and gives eternal life, a gospel that is sadly neglected in favor of a message that's all about me? And does the life of the minister bear witness to the joy of that reconciliation, of that forgiveness, or is it all just lip service? Believe me, I don't say this lightly. It's a sobering thing to read about teachers and Jesus telling the flock to watch the teachers. But it should also be sobering for you too. And I say that not just to shift the responsibility onto you, but to make sure that you see that you also have something of a part in this. Christ's words certainly apply to preachers, don't they? But they also apply to the church as a whole. For the church is made up not only of preachers. How terrible would that be if there were only preachers? The church is made up also of hearers, of listeners. And together we exist as a corporate, unified bunch. This is why we have doctrine, so that we may be divided from error and united together in the truth. And as a unified community, the church is a prophetic, a teaching community. We exist to teach the fullness of God's word, his law and his gospel. And so in our worship, in our study, in our life together, we bear witness to the will of the Father. And in our private lives, our words and our actions lend credibility to that message so that others may see and know us by our fruit. When you go out from this place, you are not separated from the root, Christ Jesus. You go out as branches still connected to the vine, tied in to the great tree of the church, connected to our Lord Jesus. And so each of you, in whatever place our Lord has called you, has this responsibility, has this great calling to bear the fruits of faith, hope, and love. And as you do, as you do, you lend credibility to the church's witness. That doesn't mean that you must be perfect at all times and places. You should try, but of course you know that you will fail. And even in your failure, Even in your failure, you show to the world what repentance looks like, how to turn back to the Lord and seek his grace, how to change your life, how to actually make an amendment of life and find forgiveness. This is the great calling of the church, to be a tree. Preachers are to be a tree within the church, but the church as a whole is a tree in this world. And on the tree's branches, there is fruit for the salvation of all of the nations, You have a part to play in all of that, each of you. This gospel reading is a great warning. We make no mistake about that. But within every warning, within every caution about false teachers, we can also see something about true ones, can't we? If Jesus says, avoid the false teachers, that implies that there are also true teachers. And if you avoid the false ones, what do you do with the true ones? Well, what would you do if you had a peach tree in your backyard? What would you do if you had a peach tree in your backyard that laid out its fruit for you, not just for 11 weeks or however long the peach season might be, but what would you do if you had a fruit tree that produced good fruit all of the time? For the truth about God's word is that it is like that kind of a tree, and the church is like that kind of a tree that that has prepared for you fruit that never goes out of season, that never molds or rusts or decays. And you know how it is with fruit. If you eat too much of it, bad things happen to you, right? We won't go into it. But can you ever eat too much of God's word? Can you ever know his law too perfectly and it makes you sick? Can you ever treasure his gospel promises too much and it makes you say, oh, I've had enough. This isn't good. No, 
The fruit of God's word is in season all of the time. And the more that you eat of it, the more satisfied you become, the more hungry it makes you all the time. Further in, farther up, avoid what is false and treasure what is true. To Christ be the glory now and always. Amen.